president of today's function, uh, Advocate Sur Bhatsarthi, uh, Chief Guest, Advocate Thomas Abraham, President of uh, Kerala High Court Advocates Association, Honorable Judges of the High Court, Judicial Officers, Members of the Bar, Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, Indian Law Institute, Kerala State Unit, along with the Kerala State Legal Services Authority and the Kerala High Court Advocates Association is jointly organizing this function to befittingly honor and commemorate the adoption of the Constitution of India. We have the best legal minds gathered here for this function. Without much ado, I would like to invite all the respective viewers to be a part of this August meeting. The president of today's function, Honorable Mr. Justice A.K. Jayashankar Dambiya, sir, Judge High Court of Kerala, is an executive council member of the Indian Law Institute. An expert in constitutional law, his lordship has rendered various judgments touching upon the nuances of the constitutional law. I, on behalf of the ILI, Kelsa and Association, welcome you, sir, to this August gathering. Uh, Advocate Thomas Abraham, sir, will be joining us shortly. Uh, he is a leader of Kerala High Court Advocates Association. He has very efficiently led the advocates during the most testing times of the pandemic and has always stood for the rule of law by insisting that lawyers get effective means, measures, and opportunity of representation of cases, particularly be before the constitutional courts of the state. I welcome you, sir, to this August function. Sri Surat Parsari, our guest, uh, lawyer par excellence, who has consented to deliver a special address, is an alumni of uh, National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata, and has an MS in Journalism from Columbia University, New York. An avid writer, uh, Mr. Suhurth has been regularly providing both lawyers and laymen his unique perceptions on vast array of subjects, ranging from jurisprudence to sports. His review on the books by Simon Critchley and Law Lauren Ribo shows passion and dexterity in the sports as well as literature. A regular columnist for the Hindu, he has been regularly contributing to other dailies and magazines, including the Indian Express, New Yorker, New York Times, Caravan Magazine, Economic and Political Weekly, etc. Uh, Suhurth has made commendable contributions by way of his writings to our uh, to the legal academia. He has written on various topics on constitutional law, including the collegium system, social justice, religious freedom, personal liberty, etc. He has agreed to speak on the doctrine of proportionality, analyzing the concept from a comparative perspective, a topic which occupies a cardinal position, particularly in, in the administrative law, is of European origin. This doctrine, which call, calls for a reasonable nexus between the desired results and the measures taken to reach that goal, is ingrained in part three of the Constitution of India. Proportionality has been defined as a way in which the decision maker has ordered his priority. As such, an understanding of this concept of the doctrine of proportionality is not just relevant, but highly essential for lawyers, judges, and laymen. Undertaking a comparative analysis of this constitutional subject is a befitting way to commemorate the auspicious day on which our constitution has been adopted. Suhurth's thoughts, I'm sure, will entice the jurisprudential interest of each one of us. On behalf of the Indian Law Institute, uh, Kerala State Unit, Kelsa and Kerala High Court Advocates Association. I welcome you, Suhrut, to this August gathering. Thank you. Sri Nizar Ahmed, District Judge and Member Secretary of uh, Kerala State Legal Service Authority, is very active in implementing the objectives of a legal service authority and has been instrumentalist in ensuring the proper discharge of the constitutional obligation of social justice. I welcome you, sir, to this August gathering. Considering our request, the Honorable Judges of this Honorable Court, Judicial Officers from across the state and members of the Bar have been gracious enough to attend the lecture online. I am sure that this online lecture would enrich our intellect. On behalf of ILI, Kelsa and Kerala High Court Advocates Association, I wholeheartedly welcome each one of you to this function. Now, uh, may I invite His Lordship Mr. Justice A.K. Jayashankar Dambiya, sir, to deliver the presidential address, sir. Thank you, Jay, for the, the welcome address. A very warm welcome to all the participants uh, on this virtual platform. 26 November is observed as a Constitution Day, uh, essentially to commemorate the adoption of the Constitution. This year also, coincidentally, is the 131st birth anniversary of uh, Bhimra Ambedkar who chaired the committee that drafted the constitution. And it is appropriate, therefore, to remind ourselves of the famous quoted words of uh, uh, Mr. Ambedkar in the last session of the Constituent Assembly, uh, 
where he he said that uh, the success of a constitution as to whether it is good or bad will depend ultimately on the people who work it and this hasn't been truer uh, in our country at the time of its adoption in 1949 we have to remember that this was hailed as the lengthiest constitution of the modern world and uh, for those of you who do not know it it was also the lengthiest handwritten constitution of the modern world now amidst the hope and the optimism that was expressed by the majority of the teeming millions who constituted the citizens of this country there was also a fair deal of skepticism coming from various quarters primarily among them uh from the british academician and jurist uh sir uh iver jennings now what iver jennings had to say is interesting he said the constitution of india is too long too rigid and too bogged down in history and at the time when he made those remarks uh we have to bear in mind that modern constitutions had an average lifespan of about 16 to 17 years and so he gave our constitution a lifespan of say 10 years well we proved him wrong just as well uh we've we've now covered seven decades of working this constitution and counting but most importantly we did we did fare much better than a constitution that sir iver jennings himself drafted which was the which was the constitution of ceylon that lasted for uh, a little above 6 years so what what exactly has contributed to the survival of this document now our constitution has been variously called uh, a people's constitution by rohit de gautam bhatia surat's friend calls it the transformative constitution the first biographer uh ramil austin prefer to it as primarily a social document now according to me the the one thing that is responsible for this document having endured so long and which has ensured its survival as a governing document is the constant engagement and uh uh interaction if you would call it of our people with the constitution on a daily basis there is not a day that goes by, by in india where where the constitution is not either discussed or deliberated upon in some forum or the other and i think it is this engagement uh that has led to the constitution actually surviving for all these years and the and it is this very engagement that we seek to uh encourage through these programs that we organize on constitution day today this program is organized jointly by the kerala branch of the indian law institute the advocate association kerala high court advocate association and the kerala legal services authority and we are doing this because we believe that it is the solemn obligation of a legal fraternity to ensure the continued effectiveness of this a uh, vital document of governance in our country we have today an eminent jurist in our midst surat patsarthi from madras who will no doubt provide the intellectual stimulus for the day through his talk on the doctrine of proportionality in the context of our constitution let me not detain this gathering uh, for much longer let me conclude by thanking you all for your presence on this virtual platform and most importantly thanking you all for taking your time of your busy schedules to be here thank you and jai hind thank you sir so may I now invite uh, thomas abraham sir sir good evening to you all all the mr justice he is a senior member who presides over this function she is with participate the educate madras high court whose brilliant eloquence we are going to experience 
ശ്രീ കെ ജി നിസാർ അഹമ്മദ് ബംഗാൾ സെക്രട്ടറി കേരള സ്റ്റേറ്റ് ലീഗൽ സർവീസ് അതോറിറ്റി ആൻഡ് മൈ ഫ്രണ്ട് ശ്രീ പി ജി ജയശങ്കർ ഐ ഓൾസോ വാം ദി വെൽക്കം ഓൾ ഹു ആർ പാർട്ടിസിപ്പേറ്റ് യു ഓൺലൈൻ ഇൻ ദ കറന്റ് സിനേരിയോ നവംബർ ട്വന്റി സിക്സ് ഹാസ് സ്പെഷ്യൽ സിഗ്നിഫിക്കൻസ് ആസ് അവർ ഇൻവാലുബിൾ കോൺസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂഷൻ ആസ് എ ടീം a continual role in the management of all the issues the country faces it is not merely a law the story powers on various authorities guaranteeing rights to citizens and reminding them of their duties but a document capable of evoking strong sentiments in the minds of all of us right from the valleys of himalayas to the shores of kanyakumari I am refraining from again recollecting the importance of the day. As it is on November 26, 1949, the Constitution was adopted in the last session of the Constitution Assembly. That August body met, on 100, met for 165 days, spread over two years, 11 months and 17 days, before the crucial resolution of adoption of the Constitution was passed. when the country observes this day as a national law day as well we the members of the legal fraternity should feel extremely proud of the yogan work done by the drafting committee chaired by dr bitkar which is just one of the 17 committees of the constituent assembly but after the supreme law making body our parliament and the legislative bodies of the state came to be on reviewing its performance in the last over seven decades we feel that our legislative bodies are not doing full justice to noble and revered tradition of the constituent assembly this is a matter which should inflict fatherless pain to all persons who believe that it is only on the bedrock of democratic values that our constitution is safe we have a constitution which declares a qualified trust in secularism if i am not wrong the word secularism was coined by George Jacob Fodio, a British reformer. He gave the name to a movement and school of thought, which stood for human values more than religious beliefs. Now, though we declare this in the Constitution, in the preamble itself, that this country will be a secular country, narrow religious feelings are used to create a divide among the people, which is extremely dangerous for the entire country. the second warning dr abdkar gave us a part of the speech he delivered a very moving speech indeed in the constituent assembly on the 25th november 1949 has special significance in this speech i quote bhakti in a religion may be road to salvation of the soul but in politics bhakti of human worship is a sure road to degradation and to eventual dictatorship I refrain from going any further. Each day's developments around us remind us that the significance of the warning that, that Dr. Ambedkar gave to us all is gaining more and more relevance and that we have to be careful to safeguard all good virtues of the Constitution like the pupil of rice. This day can be utilized for asserting our commitment to safeguard the Constitution. and all the noble values enshrined in the same in these days of crisis as members of the legal fraternity we cannot sit back and relax our great predecessors who left the legal profession to take up the challenging task of leading the freedom struggle and later coining every letter word and sentence carefully to make a wonderful constitution the largest written constitution of the biggest democracy in the world should inspire us and impart the impetus to strive for the protection of the constitution using the legal training and knowledge we have acquired we all know that the constitution was not type set up to that but it was handed down by calligraphist prem bihari narayan raiswada in the by pronunciation is correct now let each one of us the citizens of india express our commitment to the constitution by copying the noble virtues of that wonderful document on the walls of our hearts 
to keep them as part of our lives till our end. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. May I invite uh, Adagat Suhur? Suhur, please. Justice Jayashankar and Nambiar, uh, other judges of the Kerala High Court, uh, Mr. Thomas Abraham, Mr. Nisar Ahmed, Mr. P.G. Jayashankar, uh, fellow advocates, students, and friends, a very good afternoon to all of you. Let me begin by uh, expressing my gratitude to the Kerala chapter of the Indian Law Institute and to Justice Alexander Thomas for inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, November 26th uh, marks the date, of course, uh, as the previous speaker said, on which in 1949, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, the chairperson of the Constitution Drafting Committee, put to vote a motion in the Constituent Assembly to treat the Constitution as passed. The motion sailed through amid uh, considerable cheers, but for many years thereafter, the date was scarcely noted. In 1969, the Supreme Court Bar Association declared November 26th as Law Day, which was a red letter day in the words of the association's then president, Dr. L.M. Singhvi. He felt that the day should serve as an occasion to, among other things, emphasize the role and importance of law in the life of our republic, to review the state of law and administration of justice, and to suggest ways and means of improving our laws and our legal and judicial system. So in many ways, my endeavor today shall be this, to review a particular area of the law and to see where it stands today in our system of justice delivery and to provide a critique of its workings. Now, today we take as axiomatic to the idea of the rule of law the principle that laws should be clear, intelligible, and predictable. What this also means, and I really see this as a corollary of sorts, is that the legal standards that we apply for judicial review of constitutional and administrative action must also be clear and intelligible. Uh, today's topic, the doctrine of proportionality, has many antecedents, but the substance of it, especially given how it's been applied, is in the Indian context not especially clear and, inte and intelligible. My effort today, therefore, is threefold. One, to discuss how proportionality has been viewed as a standard of administrative and constitutional law in other jurisdictions, particularly in common law countries such as Britain, Canada, and Israel. Two, to describe how the standard has been adopted in India and how it has evolved over the years. And three, to deliver a critique of that adoption with a view to providing a potential path forward. But before I get to what proportionality is, I think we must start with something a little more basic. Much as we do uh, take as obvious the idea that any law ought to be clear and, and, and precise, we also take it as obvious that the interests of the rule of law require that the discretion vested in the state be guided by well-defined principles. Now, some jurists of the common law tradition, such as Dicey, for example, rallied against all forms of discretion. He believed that the very vesting of discretion in the state leads to authoritarianism. Lord Hewitt, who is, of course, well known for the famous dictum that justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done, took Dicey's view further forward when he published a book in 1929 that was titled The New Despotism. Now, in this book, Lord Hewitt assailed the various grants of administrative discretion. He pointed out to different legislation in Britain which granted complete discretion to the executive and which stipulated that government decisions would be final and conclusive. And he argued that this vesting of absolute discretion beyond all judicial control and the erosion of the doctrine of ultra virus was injurious to the rule of law. But I think today we can quite safely say that discretion is an aspect of the administrative state that cannot really be wholly eliminated. But it's also fair to say on a reading of Dicey and Hewitt 
that we must aim, if not to eliminate discretion, at least to reduce discretion in the way in which the state is governed. So the rule of law requires that we ensure that discretion is applied based on a set of clearly defined guidelines and procedures. Our liberties, our right to be treated as equal beings, our ability to interact not only with the state but with each other depends on discretion being applied in a manner that is consistent with a set of well-defined precepts. And one of those precepts that the judiciary has evolved to act as a guide for discretion is this theory of proportionality. And we should look at that theory and try and understand it in the context of this preface on the basis of the idea that our standards of judicial review, in so far as they are applied to reducing and streamlining discretion, must be clear, consistent, and precise. So we'll start with the most obvious question, which is, what is proportionality? The Harvard Law Professor V.C. Jackson says that proportionality can be understood as many things, as a goal of government, as a legal principle, and of course, is a very particular and structured approach to judicial review. Now, when we see it as a goal of government, we see it as a precept of justice, that the state has a duty broadly to ensure that its interventions are proportional, that any harm that it causes is justified by a proportional rationale. However, we now know that many countries apply proportionality in its third sense, as a very specific legal standard, as a doctrine that is used to test whether government has erred through its actions or inactions. It is this sense of the term that we are concerned with for our present purposes today. Now, Again, some in the West like to go as far back as Aristotle and his Nicomachean ethics, where he argued for justice as proportionality to understand the origins of the legal standard. Now, indeed, if we go back to our own ancient systems of justice delivery, we may find in it the idea of proportional justice. But proportionality as a legal doctrine in the way in which we understand it today was first really adopted in the Prussian administrative state. Between 1882 and 1914, the cases conducted by the Prussian Supreme Administrative Court laid the foundation for a review predicated on proportionality. Now, during this period, Prussia moved from an authoritarian state in which the Kaiser was the sovereign and the source of absolute authority into a state governed by the rule of law, a Reichstag. And that law stipulated that while the government possessed police powers to ensure public peace, those powers were to be used only to the extent of achieving that goal. In literal terms, what the law said was that the police is to take necessary measures for the maintenance of public peace, security, and order. Thus, a requirement of proportionality came to be codified into the law. And to this state, it is this principle that stands crystallized in German public law. But although the Prussian Reichstag demanded proportionality, there was no independent authority that could hold the government accountable. That system came to be instilled a little later in 1883, when the State Administrative Act there accorded the Prussian Supreme Administrative Court the authority to review administrative acts of the state. And it was an exercise of this power that the court wound up fashioning a doctrine of proportionality. The, it rendered several rulings, for example, uh, including on an attempt to ban the play, uh, which was called The Weavers, written by the German playwright Gerhard Hauptmann in 1892. The state saw the play as being sympathetic to the cause of those revolting against capitalism. Well, the court ruled that the police could not ban its performance on a mere surmise or conjecture that it might lead to the fermenting of disorder. The court said that there must be an actual near and impending danger to justify censorship. And it was through this doctrine that the idea of human rights really was installed into German law. Unlike the United States, which needed legal doctrine to limit the rights guaranteed by the constitution through the Bill of Rights, in Germany, they needed a doctrine to create the rights. And that doctrine was proportionality. So it is built on what the South African legal scholar Etienne Murenik has described as a culture of justification, a term that's really since been adopted by scholars across the world. Uh, Murenik had defined the term as one in which every exercise of power 
is expected to be justified in which the leadership given by government rests on the cogency of the case offered in defense of its decisions and not the fear that is inspired by the force at its command now we'll come back to muranik and the culture of justification later in the talk for now we only need to keep in mind that proportionality as evolved in prussia came to ultimately find fruition in post world war 2 germany the german basic law of 1949 put in place a system in which a bill of rights was guaranteed and a federal constitutional court was established to help enforce those rights now this charter itself as uh, aharon barak uh, the former israeli chief justice explains in his book uh, proportionality constitutional rights and their limitations it doesn't contain any express mention of the term proportionality but almost from its inception the german constitutional court has used the doctrine to limit the state's power an example of this is uh, in the decision of 1973 in the secret tape recordings case the question there was whether a recording made without the knowledge and consent of a speaker can serve as evidence in a court of law the court said that the use of such a recording limited the right to free development of a person's personality which was protected by article 2 sub clause 1 of the basic law i'll just read the court said it is not the entire sphere of private life which falls under the absolute protection of the basic right under article 2 1 in conjunction with article 1 1 of the basic law the individual as part of a community rather has to accept such state interventions which are based on an overriding community interest under the strict application of the principle of proportionality as long as they do not affect the inviolate sphere of private life now what this meant according to the court was that the court could test every administrative measure and see whether there was a proper purpose at stake whether there was a rational connection between the means used by the limiting state action and the purpose involved whether there were less intrusive means available to achieve that very same purpose and finally whether a proper balance had been struck between the limitation on the right and the benefit gained by the limiting statute now from germany this doctrine migrated into the rest of europe and into the laws of the european union in 1970 in the case of internationale uh, handels gelschaft the european court of justice gave substance to this test now we don't need to get into the nitty gritties of that for our present purposes today but at some, i mean at this point some of you might also be wondering how a doctrine which developed within the civil law tradition of germany is capable of being carried into the common law where traditionally deference for administrative action has been the norm now in the uk for example we all know that for many years it was only the wensbury principle of reasonableness that was invoked that was seen as the common law standard now indeed the adoption of proportionality in britain has been far from straightforward but before we get to britain we must for a few moments turn our attention to canada which is really perhaps the first common law country where the doctrine was truly embraced and this is important to note uh, even to understand it from the perspective of india because uh, a number of indian judgments have relied heavily on canadian case law but what is also critical to see here is that the adoption of this doctrine of proportionality in canada happened not so much organically as it did with the codification of human rights law in the country through the canadian charter of rights and freedoms in 1982 now until then there was no concept of proportionality in canada but section 1 of this charter stipulated a general limitation and this is quite unlike the indian constitution where each right is subject to its own limitations in india we have articles 191a b c d e and g being subject to articles 192 to 6 respectively article 21 uh, has the concept of procedure established by law so each fundamental right has its own set of limitations but in canada for the entirety of the chapter the limitation was prescribed in section 1 and section 1 of the canadian charter says the charter guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject to such reasonable limits which are prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society 
But even before the courts could really render a ruling on Section 1, a leading Canadian law scholar, uh, Peter Hogg, looked at the European Court of Human Rights and its various judgments, which emanated out of the uh, European Court, to provide what he thought was a plausible interpretation of the limitation prescribed in Section 1. So what might the words reasonable and demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society mean? Peter Hogg said that the word reasonable means that a limit on charter rights must be rationally related to a legitimate purpose and that the word reasonable contained within it an idea of proportionality. Of course, it wasn't too long thereafter before the Canadian Supreme Court had a chance to rule on the meaning of Section 1 in R versus Oaks in 1986. This was a case where a petitioner had claimed that a reverse onus, which was created by a presumption of possession for the purposes of trafficking, violated the guarantee of a presumption of innocence under the Charter. Now, Section 11D of the Charter provided for a presumption of innocence. So the issue before the court really was whether the provision of law, which provided for a presumption of guilt, violated Section 11D of the Charter or not. The court's opinion, uh, which has since really come to be known as the Oaks Test, and has also since been adopted by courts across the world, including in some cases by the Supreme Court of India, was delivered by Chief Justice Dixon. He said that to establish that a limit is reasonable and demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, two central criteria must be satisfied. First, the objective which the measure is responsible for a limit on a charter right of freedom are designed to serve must be of sufficient importance to really warrant overriding a constitutionally protected right. The standard must be high in order to ensure that the objectives at stake are not trivial and are not somehow uh, antithetical to the principles integral to a free and democratic society. So it is necessary, he said, that at a minimum, that an objective of the state must relate to concerns which are pressing and substantial in a free and democratic society before it can be characterized as sufficiently important. And second, he said that once a sufficiently significant objective is recognized, then the party that is invoking section one must show that the means chosen are reasonable and demonstrably justified. That is, the onus is really on the state in many cases to show that the means that it has chosen are reasonable and demonstrably justified. And this, according to the court, involved a form of proportionality test. And the court went on to hold that the nature of the test might, of course, vary based on different fact situations. But in each case, judicial review will have to necessarily balance the interests of society with those of individuals and groups. The test itself, according to Chief Justice Dixon, involved three different prongs. First, the measures adopted by the state must be carefully designed to achieve the objective in question. That is, they can't be arbitrary, unfair, or based on entirely irrational or extraneous considerations. That is, to put it very shortly, it should have a rational connection to the objective. Second, the means, even if they are rationally connected to the objective, they should encroach upon and impair as little as possible the right of freedom in question. And third and finally, there must be a proportionality between the effects of the measures which are responsible for limiting the charter right and the objective which has been identified as one of sufficient importance. Now, having outlined this test, the court did what our own Supreme Court, if I may say so, with the greatest of respect, has on occasion failed to do, which is to apply the test and see whether the relevant provision of the statute in question, that is the Narcotic Controls Act, violated the charter or not. In other words, the question of whether the reverse onus provision constituted a reasonable limit on the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty, as can be demonstrably justified, of course, in a free and democratic society. Now, the court held that the objective of 
protecting Canadian society from the grave ills that are associated with drug trafficking is certainly one of sufficient importance to warrant overriding a constitutionally protected right of freedom in certain cases. So as far as the first prong was concerned, the court was satisfied that this is an issue of substantial importance in a free and democratic society. But the next stage of the inquiry was crucial. That is, what about the means chosen by parliament to achieve its objective? The court held that on the facts of the case, this rational connection test did not quite stand satisfied. Because the court felt that the possession of a small or negligible quantity of narcotics would not support the inference of trafficking. In other words, it said that it would simply be irrational to infer that a person had an intent to traffic based on his or her possession of a very small quantity of narcotics. Therefore, it felt that the presumption was over-inclusive and could lead to results in certain cases which would defy both rationality and fairness. Now, since then, since the decision in R versus Oaks, in almost all cases where a plea is raised invoking the charter, the Canadian charter, the test that has been applied in Canada has been a test of proportionality. But we must bear in mind that the Canadian court does make a distinction when it comes to everyday administrative law cases. In these cases, the court has been less keen on applying the test. But in Canada, unlike perhaps India, a clear line is drawn between what are called charter cases and what are otherwise cases in the realm of public law, but not quite charter cases. Now, one example of this was in Doe versus Beroudou, Quebec in 2012, where the case concerned an advocate who had been suspended on the basis of an application of the code of ethics which applied to advocates, which was the statute in question. And the advocate claimed that his right to freedom of expression had been breached. Charter rights were undoubtedly at stake, but the court said that to determine whether administrative decision makers had exercised their statutory discretion in accordance with the charter or not, the review should be in accordance with an administrative law approach and not a section one Oaks analysis based on proportionality. The court felt that administrative law decisions which affected a single individual called for a more flexible approach and that to apply a full Oaks test based on proportionality would be unwieldy and simply not practical. So the standard according to the court had to be one of reasonableness. And this would involve seeing what the statutory objectives were, that is what the Code of Advocates essentially entailed and what, what, what its primary uh, purpose and objective was, to and to determine how the cha charter values at issue were best protected in view of those objectives. So unless the constitutionality of a statute was specifically challenged, a mere administrative decision in, Cal in Canada would not be susceptible to a test of proportionality. In those cases, the courts tend to show a greater degree of deference to the administrative decision makers, that is the executive. But nonetheless, the Oaks test has traveled across the oceans. In the UK, from at least 1948 onwards, as I said earlier, the principle has been one of Wensbury unreasonableness, which is, of course, derived from the ruling in the judgment in associated uh, provincial picture houses versus Wensbury Corporation. Most of us would be familiar with this ruling. The standard that was set there basically said that courts should be hesitant to intervene in administrative decisions unless the unreasonableness was extreme. That is so outrageous in its defiance of logic or accepted moral standards that no sensible person who had applied his mind to a particular question could have arrived at that sort of conclusion. Now, this was, of course, Wensbury as reformulated by Lord Diplock in his 1996 judgment in Council of Civil Service Unions. But it's really, you know, when we look at the Wensbury principle, it's hard to see how a sense of outrage or illogic or immorality really can be applied as standards of judicial review. And there has been substantial critique of Lord Diplock's formulation, including by the scholar Paul Craig, who has said that there can be 
no pretense of any meaningful substantial review and it is difficult to think of a single real case in which the facts might meet the wensbury standard as at least certainly as formulated by lord diplom so all of this is really meant that wensbury is still a test that doesn't quite contain clear bright lines and it leaves us searching for what really uh, for what unreasonableness really means now in this case in this case which lord diplock decided he does refer to proportionality but he doesn't adopt it leaving it instead to a future date but in 1998 soon thereafter the united kingdom adopted the human rights act now the rights contained in the european convention of human rights now became enforceable in britain within the framework of statutory and treaty law but quite independent of the human rights act and its role leading to the adoption of proportionality in the uk the privy council in 1999 in a judgment named defratus where uh, the case came up from the court of appeal of antigua and barbuda established a three prong test for administrative action and it adopted a proportionality analysis it said that the questions that need to be asked are firstly whether the legislative objective is sufficiently important to justify limiting a fundamental right secondly whether the measures designed to meet the legislative objective are rationally connected to it and third whether the means used to impair the right of freedom are no more than are necessary to accomplish to accomplish the objective as we can see in this sort of three prong test this was for all practical purposes nothing but the oak standard if only shown of the need for balancing that was an additional norm that was used by the canadian courts but this test in defratus came to be a firm as a four pronged test in bank mellet versus her majesty's treasury in 2013 by the uk supreme court in the context of the human rights act now the question in bank mellet arose out of the treasury's directions under the counter terrorism act requiring that all persons who operated in the financial sector were directed not to have any commercial dealings with this bank mellet now the uk treasury had said that the bank had connections with iran's nuclear and ballistic missile program and therefore that these uh, this measure was enforced the bank questioned the decision and the case went made its way all the way up to the uk Su supreme court and the court through lord justice sumption applied the proportionality test he again summarized the test and broadly in lines with what we've seen in canada he said that what you need to see is firstly whether there was a sufficiently important objective whether the measure adopted was rationally connected to that objective whether there were less intrusive and reasonable means that were in fact available to the state which would have had a less harmful effect on a on the right in question and finally whether a fair balance had been struck between individual rights and public interest now as lord reed noted in his partial dissent in the very same case this standard was really nothing but that adopted by the canadian supreme court in oaks and lord as lord reed said this a uh, standard of proportionality the oaks test it has a substantial attraction as a heuristic tool in that it breaks down the assessment of proportionality into distinct elements and you can make value judgments explicitly on the basis of those elements so there are clear bright lines that are at play so again like oaks uh, the judgment in bank mellet has particular relevance in the indian context because the supreme court of india did rely on this judgment quite heavily in its uh, judgment uh, concerning the virtual ban on cryptocurrency and we'll come to that a little later because before we get to all of that let's be sure that the this adoption of proportionality in the uk through these judgments in defratus and bank mellet it's far from con non controversial there's a substantial debate that that is continuing to happen over whether the test will really survive the many consequences of brexit including the eventual fate of the human rights act but many scholars do believe as lord reed wrote in bank mellet that the doctrine of proportionality provides a clear set of bright line rules that can be applied cogently by authorities that are exercising a power of judicial review professor mark elliot for example has argued that the supreme court of the uk supreme court's judgment in fam versus Sec secretary of state 2015 
marks a turning point, as he says, in that proportionality will now serve as a common law ground of judicial review, quite regardless of whether or not it touches upon convention rights. Now, this might be, as I said, a controversial view, and there's a whole lot of debate over this in Britain, and it might not be possible for us to get into that in any further detail today. Now, what about India? The development of administrative law in India has largely coincided with the development of its constitutional law. These have not been seen as necessarily separate compartments. Indeed, a lot of the basic principles of administrative law are seen as flowing from the rights guaranteed in part three of the constitution. For example, the rules of audi alter in partem and nemo debet esse judex uh, in propria cosa, the rule that one must always hear the other side and the rule against bias, respectively, the principles of natural justice, as we describe them, are seen as flowing from the guarantee of equal treatment in Article 14. And this parallel development is also occasioned by the fact that Article 13, which defines law, includes not just law made by parliament or a state legislature, but also pure executive actions, including bylaws, notifications, orders, really any actions of the state. And state, as we know, again, by virtue of Article 12, includes a wide array of public authorities. So administrative law in India is really a combination of constitutional doctrine and common law standards. India has, Indian courts have adopted the doctrine of ultra vires, the doctrines of errors of fact and errors of law, the doctrine of legitimate expectation, and indeed really the doctrine of Wensbury unreasonableness too from the common law. But there have been other terms that have flown quite explicitly from the constitution, the idea of arbitrariness, the idea of procedural impropriety, for example, these flow from articles 14 and 21. And increasingly, I would say that the doctrine of proportionality too, which is seen not so much as a common law doctrine as it is seen as something inherent in the constitution and its text and history. So the Supreme Court of India, to be sure, it's long recognized the idea that there must exist an element of proportionality between rights and limitations on those rights. There's an article by uh, Professor Aparna Chandra uh, in the Oxford Human Rights Hub Journal, which traces this history, right from the judgments of the Supreme Court in Chintaman Rao versus State of Madhya Pradesh and State of Madras versus V.G. Rao in the 1950s, 1951 and 1952, respectively, where the court recognized this need for proportionality. But the court still sh stopped short of evolving a clear legal standard. These were statements that were made by the Supreme Court largely in the abstract as a general principle of Indian constitutionalism. So what was stated more clearly in many of the court's judgments, though, that came later was the idea of Wensbury unreasonableness. But again, as I said earlier, there was little laid down in the way of clear bright lines, and it might, in fact, be quite difficult to do so by an application of the Wensbury test. But in November 2000, in Om Kumar's case, arguably for the first time in Om Kumar versus Union of India. The Supreme Court held that proportionality is a standard that must be applied in reviewing any administrative action of the state. And the court did make a few subtle you know, uh, distinctions, and I'll come to that. But the court here wasn't concerned with a challenge to a statute which was predicated on one or the other of the fundamental rights. The question before the court was with respect to a challenge that was made to the quantum of punishments that were imposed in various departmental inquiries on officers of the Delhi Development Authority. The court looked at numerous precedents from across the world and I think came to a somewhat curious conclusion. It held that in cases where administrative action is attacked as discriminatory under Article 14, the courts are required to conduct what it called a primary review of the action by applying proportionality. On the other hand, it said where administrative action is questioned as arbitrary under Article 14, courts must adopt a principle of secondary review based on the Wensbury principle. Now, since then, the question of whether proportionality in fact applies or not to administrative action has been far from clear. In one case in Harshad Mehta versus Custodian in 1998, the Supreme Court even described the when described the principle as a Wensbury principle of proportionality. So even when describing its standard as one of proportionality, the court was in fact continuing to apply the Wensbury standard of unreasonableness, where it was showing a great and substantial amount of deference to decisions taken by public authorities. And it was interfering only when the court found the action to be wholly unconscionable. But what was unconscionable invariably differed from judge to judge. 
leading, I think, to an inevitable arbitrariness in judicial review. The court paid lip service to proportionality in many cases following Om Kumar, but did not, in fact, apply the various prongs of the test as identified in Oaks or Defratus. So what the court was effectively doing in all these cases was to continue to apply the Wensbury standard. It was striking down decisions that it found unreasonable based on its own conscience, based on what it thought and felt was arbitrary or discriminatory without using any clearly identified or structured test. So for example, in Chairman All India Rec Board versus K. Shyam Kumar, 2010 judgment, the Supreme Court upheld the decision of the executive authority by applying what it said was both Wensbury and proportionality. But if we had to study the court's actual application of propor proportionality, it only really refers to the aspect of balancing. The other prongs of the test are completely absent. But what we must recognize is that the great benefit of proportionality as a doctrine lies in its structure. Now, of course, one could argue about its potential rigidity, but it's also possible to make the test more flexible without losing its core tenets. And that is something that we'll come to at the end of the talk. So Om Kumar, while seemingly laying down the foundations for proportionality as a test for judicial review, ultimately had little by way of impact. This confusion that prevailed across Indian administrative law was also carried over to more direct constitutional challenges. In 1996, for example, in the McDowell's case, State of Andhra Pradesh was in McDowell, the Supreme Court described the test of proportionality as a debatable proposition. Even in the sphere of administrative law, the court said, this, the application of the test is unsettled, and therefore there was little question of applying it to strike down an enactment. But perhaps slowly things began to change, even if the changes came with little addition to clarity. In 2007, in Anuj Garg versus Hotel Association of India, the Supreme Court hinted that the doctrine of proportionality might well apply to constitutional challenges. Here, of course, in Anuj Garg, the uh, issue in question was the validity of a provision of the Punjab Excise Act, which basically prohibited the employment of any man under the age of 25 and any woman in a premises where liquor or other in intoxicating drug was being consumed by the public. This provision was challenged before the court and the court struck it down. But it did so by really wielding a wide array of tools from the doctrines of strict scrutiny, immediate scrutiny, and to proportionality. Now, without expressly invoking Canadian law, the court said that the standard for judging proportionality should be a standard capable of being called reasonable in a modern democratic society. The court also held here that once a prima facie restriction on a fundamental right was shown, the onus was then on the state to show that the measure adopted by it was proportional. So there were a number of incremental uh, progression that was made by this judgment, but ultimately the court held and ultimately, the court struck down the uh, provision and said that there surely must be other ways available to enhance women's security rather than placing a complete prohibition on liberty. But again, there were no bright lines laid down or applied. It came down to a certain form of ad hocism, where judges were ruling largely based on conscience, based on what felt like justice to them. And of course, in many of these cases, the ultimate judgment would be correct, whether one applies proportionality or not, in the sense that an application of proportionality might well have led to the same outcome. But it did cause, I think, a substantial amount of uh, jurisprudential confusion. Now, from Anuj Garg, we can move a decade later to 2016 and to the judgment of the Supreme Court in modern dental college versus state of Madhya Pradesh. This is an important judgment in the context of proportionality. Uh, here in challenge were a set of, was, a, was a legislation and the uh, Madhya Pradesh private medical examination rules, which were framed under that legislation. Uh, writing for the majority, Justice A.K. Sikri relied on Aharon Barak and the Israeli conception of proportionality. And he said that there were four subcomponents of proportionality which need to be satisfied. We come time and again back to this four-prong test. And in, but this is really the first time that this four-prong test was spoken of in the context of Indian constitutional law. And here, the court held that a limitation of a constitutional right will be constitutionally permissible if one, it is designed for a proper purpose, if the measures undertaken to effect this limitation are rationally connected to the fulfillment of that purpose, if the measures undertaken are necessary. This necessary prong basically means that there should be no other alternative means that is available to the state which can achieve the same purpose with a lesser impact on the fundamental right or other right in question. And finally, 
the question of balancing, whether there's a proper relation between the importance of achieving the public purpose and the social importance of preventing the limitation of the constitutional right. Now, from this four-pronged test, the court then referred to the Oaks test and held that this test did, in fact, apply to India. Justice Sikri found that the doctrine of proportionality as expounded by Aaron Barak and Chief Justice Dixon was, in fact, enshrined in Article 19 itself. When we read Clause 1 and A, B, C, D, E, and G, along with Clauses 2 to 6, he felt that it was something that flowed from there. But propounding the test was as far as the court went. It didn't actually take the four steps and apply them one after another in any structured manner based on the facts that were before. Now, this is a scenario that has since been repeated by the Supreme Court time after time. In Puttaswamy 1, uh, which was decided by a bench of nine judges, there, of course, could not have been any actual application. The bench was constituted to decide a pure question of law on whether there existed a fundamental right to privacy or not. The court answered the question in the affirmative, but a majority on the bench also said that any restriction on privacy must be proportionate. And the first opportunity that the court got after Puttaswamy 1 was in Puttaswamy 2, where uh, the Aadhaar Act was assailed. And Justice Sikri again wrote the opinion for the majority. He somewhat altered the test that he had propounded in modern dental. He moved away from Barak's conception and the Oaks test and said that in the Indian context, we must apply what the South African scholar David Bilchitz has recommended. Now, David Bilchitz's test really involved the following. First, it requires a range of, uh, it requires the court to sort of identify a range of possible alternatives to a measure adopted that could have been employed. Second, to look at the effectiveness of these measures independently and determine them individually. Now, the test here is not whether each respective measure realizes the government objective to the same extent, but whether it realizes it in a real and substantial manner. Third, the impact of the respective measures on the rights in the stake must be determined. And finally, an overall judgment must be made as to whether in light of the findings on the previous three steps, whether there exists an alternative which is preferable. So in the context of the Aadhaar Act, an application of this would have involved the following, right? The court would have had to have identified, based on obviously assertions made by the petitioners, about the range of alternatives that were available to the government. What are the other systems that could have been evolved in place of having a unique biometric identity? There was, for example, some measures that were suggested, including an identity card uh, issued, which was issued by the Tamil Nadu government, a computerized identity. Then to take those measures and study the effectiveness of those measures individually to see whether they could achieve the purpose of the law. Now, if the Aadhaar Act is meant to improve access to social security, one has to then see if the alternative which was suggested, which was the other, uh, which was the other means that was already being used in Tamil Nadu, for example, whether that smart card which was being employed could also, in a real and substantial way, lead to a better delivery of social welfare means. And then see where, which measure had a less onerous impact on the fundamental right in question, in this case, the right to privacy. And finally, conduct this balancing inquiry. But now, although the judgment offered no reasons why Professor Bilchit's formulation was more suited to India, it just rather went ahead and adopted it. But the bigger question is, did it really apply it? Now, if we look at the majority's judgment, although Professor Bilchit's measure is adopted, uh, his test is adopted as, as part of the ratio decidenda. The actual factual examination that is done to the extent that it is done is not based on Professor Bilchit's test. Instead, the court once again goes back to an Oaks sort of analysis. And on the first limb, the court says that Section 7 of the Aadhaar Act was in fact aimed at offering subsidies, benefits or services to the marginalized sections of society. And therefore, this is a legitimate aim of the state. But in the second limb, the court said that this, this aim of the state is certainly bears a rational nexus with the, uh, with the measure adopted, which is the provision of a unique identity, because it felt that the provision of a unique identity might lead to these subsidies, benefits, and services reaching the intended beneficiaries. Now, even if we were to take these two prongs as having been satisfied, the third limb, there are serious problems that ensue. Because in analyzing alternatives to the Aadhaar Act, the court simply says that 
this limb stands answered by the various discussions that it has made in respect of components one and two. The court says that the manner in which malpractices have been committed in the past leaves the court with little doubt that the unique identity system of Aadhaar and the authentication of real beneficiaries, there is no alternative measure which is available to achieve the same purpose. In fact, the court says that on repeated query by the court, the court, the petitioners could not suggest any such method. Now, this with great respect is factually incorrect because the petitioners had in fact suggested alternatives. And if we go through the series of contentions, even within the judgment, we find that the petitioners had suggested an ID card scheme, a smart card scheme that had been employed with some success by the Tamil Nadu government, among other alternatives. But this competing evidence is not engaged with. And as a result, we don't get an answer to the third prong at all, whether an alternative measure would have had a less onerous impact on the right to privacy and whether therefore the act was unconstitutional or not. So since then, really the test has been invoked in several different judgments in varying contexts. In Anuradha Bashin versus Union of India, we have an application of the doctrine of proportionality. And I use the word application here with substantial reservation in the context of a ban on 4G internet in many districts in Jammu and Kashmir. These are therefore administrative orders made under a set of suspension rules that were framed under the Telegraph Act. But the court still holds that these orders prima facie limited a fundamental right to access the internet, which the court said was contained in both articles 191A and 191G, and therefore the doctrine of proportionality had to be applied in testing the orders. The court in its judgment runs through the entire history of the test from Om Kumar and modern dental to the Aadhaar cases, and from Barak and Oaks, and then summarizes the four prongs once again. But if, you, if we uh, again come to the meat of the matter, the court doesn't in fact proceed to analyze the 4G ban based on this test. And instead it leaves that task to a review committee. It basically opened up the scope for subsequent legal challenges, but, it, but in doing so it doesn't quite fulfill the sort of time honored maxim of ubi ja sibi remedium that where there's a right, there's a remedy. In any case, that is perhaps for a different day. The fact is a reading of the judgment in Anuradha Bashin gives us a fair idea of what the doctrine of proportionality is, what its place in Indian constitutionalism is, and how it can help adjudicate not merely constitutional challenges, but also challenges to administrative orders. Now, from Anuradha Bashin, we move uh, to the Supreme Court's judgment in the case of Internet Mobile Association versus Reserve Bank of India, which is uh, 2020. The challenge here was to a Reserve Bank of India circular from April 2018. Now, through this circular, the RBI didn't so as much ban the use of cryptocurrencies themselves, but the provision of banking services to any person who dealt with these currencies. Now, you can see the parallels uh, here with the judgment of the UK Supreme Court in Bank Mellet. There, a ban was imposed on one particular ban. This was a ban that was imposed virtually on all dealers of cryptocurrencies. Now, the Supreme Court struck down this circular. The court found that while the RBI certainly had the power to regulate virtual currencies, the prohibition that was imposed through this circular was disproportionate and therefore ultra varies the constitution. The court said that in the absence of any clear legislative ban, the business, the basic business of dealing in these virtual currencies ought to be treated as a legitimate trade that is protected by Article 191G. And therefore the restrictions have to be reasonable. And in judging that reasonableness, one can look at the doctrine of proportionality. Now, having noted that the proportionality test represented the relevant standard, the court then plunged into an analysis of the four prongs and whether they were met by the circular. But uh, in, uh, before doing that, in fact, it went into a consideration of the UK Supreme Court's judgment in Bank Millet. And the court noted the parallels in the facts between the two. There, of course, the UK Supreme Court that struck down the Treasury's order on the ground that the issues which the order sought to address, that is the financing of nuclear proliferation activities, were inherent to banking in general and was not special to bank melt. And therefore, in picking and choosing a single Iranian bank, the order was arbitrary, disproportionate, and irrational. What is more, the majority also found, again through Lord Sumption's opinion, that this order that was impugned there it didn't arise out of a matter of necessity because there were less drastic measures that could have been considered, which had in fact been made applicable to other Iranian banks. 
So after seeing the decision in Bank Millet and before proceeding into any proportionality analysis, the Supreme Court made two quite critical points of law. First, it held that given that a person who's denied access to banking services faces onerous consequences, including the effective shutting down of his or her trade, the burden really was on the RBI to show that its circular did not unreasonably infract on the petitioner's rights. Second, it rejected the Reserve Bank's argument that there was, in fact, no fundamental right to trade, sell, and invest in virtual currencies, and therefore that the petitioners could, in fact, invoke Article 19, could not invoke Article 19. Now, this is because there was no legislation, at least as on, on that day. Now, of course, there's a bill that's being uh, promulgated, and we don't know what the contents of that bill yet are. But since there was no legislation on that date, the court said this is a legitimate trade. Now, if you're going to restrict it, restrict it in a reasonable manner. Then the only question, therefore, was to decide whether this restriction that was imposed to the RBI circular was reasonable or not. And for that, a proportionality analysis had to be done. The court found that there were potentially other less intrusive measures available. And RBI had not considered the adoption of those measures before passing the circular. One potential alternative was a solution that had been suggested by the European Union's parliament, uh, which essentially said that cryptocurrencies need not be banned outright, but there might be good safeguards that were in place that can be put in place with, to protect the financial sector and in, in general, the larger public in order to combat money laundering, terrorism, financing, tax evasion, etc. The court held that the RBI had not considered these alternatives before issuing the circular. But what it also said that was after these writ petitions had been filed before it, the RBI had provided specific rebuttals to the petitioner's contentions. And in the court's belief, once the RBI had applied its mind at that stage to the issue and considered alternative measures, it was not in a position to now sit on judgment over whether those measures were illusory or not. So the court said that while exercising the power of judicial review, it can't scan the response of the RBI in greater detail to find out if the response to these additional safeguards were you know, merely imaginary or not. Now this finding, again, in my belief, with great respect, falls short of what a review on proportionality really demands. A review on proportionality requires an engagement with facts. It is not akin to a merits review where the court substitutes its own opinion for that, for, uh, for that of the executive. But it still requires the court to examine evidence on affidavit and see whether the alternative measures that are available are in fact feasible or not. Now, of course, ultimately, in this case, the court did strike down the circular, but it did so by applying a judgment of the Supreme Court in 19, from 1969 in Muhammad Farooq was a state of Madhya Pradesh, where, the constitu where a constitution bench of the court had held that when a right under Article 19 g is encroached by a complete prohibition of any activity, the onus is on the state to show the court that the nature of this activity is so inherently pernicious or has a capacity or tendency to be so harmful to the general public. In this case, the court said that the RBI wasn't able to quite discharge that burden by showing that a virtual ban on, of cryptocurrency was necessary or the trading of cryptocurrencies was by itself inherently pernicious or harmful to the general public. So from here, we go to a judgment of the Supreme Court in Christian Medical College, Velo versus Union of India in 2020 again, in which uh, the validity uh, of NEET as a central examination for admission into medical colleges was examined. The court relied upon and affirmed the decision in modern dental, but it didn't in fact conduct any analysis of whether the doctrine was fulfilled by the various notifications that were issued under the Medical Council Act. And finally, there's a judgment that came just a few days ago. I fortunately was able to glance at today. It's a short judgment in uh, state of Tamil Nadu versus National South Indian River in state of Tamil Nadu versus National South Indian River Interlinking Agriculturalist Association. This is a two-judge bench ruling. It was delivered by Justice Diva Chandrachu. This is a case that emanated from the Madras High Court, where the Madras High Court had struck down a government order which granted waiver of loans to small and marginal farmers alone to the exclusion of farmers holding more than five acres of land. The Supreme Court has reversed the ruling. And in doing so, it has said, and I think this is a quite important observation, it has said that when a classification is made, proportionality will not be the test, but it will only be the age-old test of reasonable classification. 
where you'll have to look at whether intelligible differentia exist and whether that differentia bears a rational nexus with the law's objective or not. Now, of course, the level of scrutiny employed in each case will depend on the nature of the law in question. In this case, because it was a case of economic policy, a greater amount of deference has been shown. But the court doesn't quite go on to explain why proportionality cannot be applicable in a case such as this, because after all, the right that was asserted was a right of equality, a right against discrimination. The court could have well seen if it was necessary, you know, that is whether the law uh, or the government order in question was necessary in order to, in, in that un, ap, making it applicable only to farmers holding land more than five acres was necessary, or whether there were less and intrusive ways and alternative ways to achieve the same objective of the law by providing benefit to small farmers in some other way, whether that was possible. The result, of course, might well have been the same, but the confusion over doctrine persists. So where do we stand today? What we know is that for constitutional challenges, where a piece of legislation is assailed for violating Article 19 of the Constitution, the relevant test to apply is one of proportionality. But what happens when a legislation is assailed not under 19 specifically, but say under Article 14? We, of course, have the judgment in Puttaswamy 1, which holds that the trident of rights contained in Articles 14, 19, and 21 are, in fact, some sort of a part of a golden triangle. Order. They ought to, this, this, I would think, ought to mean that the doctrine of proportionality is applicable each time a violation of fundamental right is claimed. But as we've seen in, in this latest judgment of the Supreme Court that just, just came a few days ago, this might not, in fact, be the case, at, at least as far as the law stands today. The next question is, what about challenges made not to legislations, but to notifications or circulars and so forth? Again, when a violation of a fundamental right is asserted, the doctrine of proportionality, as we saw both in the cryptocurrency case and in the case of 4G internet in Kashmir, is technically applicable. This is because any state action would tantamount to law under Article 13. Finally, what about the everyday actions of the administrative state, which are assailed as either ultraviaries, the parent st statute, or on grounds of regular public law standards? Now, here, there isn't as much clarity, despite the judgment of the Supreme Court in Om Kumar. We saw that in Canada, the Oak standard isn't applied to run-of-the-mill administrative decisions. But in India, several of our administrative law standards, from natural justice to arbitrariness, are gleaned from the various stipulations contained in Part 3 of the Constitution. So I would argue that this means that any administrative decision must be governed by the doctrine of proportionality. Because if we see the doctrine as the correct test for a violation of a fundamental right, then there really is no logical rationale not to apply it or to apply it to certain forms of constitutional challenges and not to apply it to challenges to administrative action. Now, this is especially so because we are meant to be a republic of reason. Our constitution is predicated on a culture of justification. Again, to borrow uh, Muranik's con conception, which we saw earlier, this is in contradistinction to a culture of authority. Now, there's a good piece of scholarly work on this published in the Indian Law Review by Janvi Sindhu and Vikram Aditya Narayan that's worth reading, they show us that a culture of authority is like a system of parliamentary sovereignty that prevails in Britain, where a single body is seen as supreme, where there are no clear checks and balances. Now, whether this is in fact true in practice or not is a different matter. But India's constituent assembly certainly rejected this idea of a culture of authority, and it did so quite explicitly. Our constitution is built on a conception of popular sovereignty. Indeed, the opening words in the preamble begin with, we the people. So when sovereignty rests in the people, any governmental decision will necessarily have to be subject to justification. But th that this is the case is also clear from the text of the constitution. If we look at article 13, three of the constitution, which defines law rather wide, widely, which makes a wide variety of governmental actions subject to fundamental rights. But again, the final question is why must a country where a culture of justification pervades rely on the doctrine of proportionality? Why not make do with the various other standards of judicial review that we've used over the years, arbitrariness, unreasonableness, substantive and procedural due process, etc. But those standards, as we've seen, are invariably incapable of being applied through clear bright line rules. They tend to be vague, and that vagueness invariably leads to a culture of judicial deference. So I think proportionality provides the answer quite well. We've seen it in other cultures of justification, notably in South Africa, and in Germany. And we've seen that it allows judges to approach the question of whether an administrative action or a piece of legislation is ultra virus with a clear sense of doctrine, with a sense of how the answers must be arrived at. 
Now, whether it has to be applied across the board, whether it's dependent on the nature of right that's alleged to have been violated, these are questions that we'll need more concrete answers to. But proportionality does provide a coherent solution to many problems. Now, still, it'll have to work hand in glove with integrity. By integrity, I mean here something along the lines of what Professor Ronald Dworkin described in Law's Empire, where principles exist to be applied. We've seen even in Aharon Barak's case, much as he's been instrumental in developing and pushing through the doctrine of proportionality, there's been a wide body of work that critiques his role in virtually preparing a judicial justification for the occupied Palestinian territory. That is record in applying the doctrine in a principled manner has been inconsistent. So ultimately, I only want to end on this sort of rather sober note that while proportionality provides us a way forward in resolving many of the muddles that we are faced with today, the key lies in applying it in a consistent, coherent, and principled manner. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, dear Suhut, uh, for an in-depth analysis. I'm very sure that everyone has immensely been benefited by your um, lecture. Now, may I invite uh, three Katie Nizar Ahmed, sir, to render the vote of thanks. President of the function, founder Mr. Justice A.K. Jayashankar Nambia, Judge High Court of Kerala Member, Executive Council, ILI Kerala. Sri Thomas Abraham, Advocate, President of Kerala High Court Association. Sri Suhut Parthasaradi, Advocate Madras High Court. P.G. Jayashankar. Honorable Judges of the High Court watching the program online. Judicial officers, panel lawyers, paralegal volunteers, staff of Kelsa, Delsa, Permanent Logadalat, KSNCC, Defense Council System. A warm good evening for one and all. The duty cast upon is to deliver what are found. For the first year time, I'm directly entering to my duty. Even, in, even if having hectic schedule, Honorable Mr. Justice A.K. Jashin and Ambas, sir, has spared more than one and a half hour with us in this program by presiding this function. On behalf of Kelsa, ILI, and Kerala High Court Advocate Association, I express our deep gratitude. Thank you, my Lord. Sri Thomas Abraham, President Kerala High Court Advocate Association. Is also always cooperating with the, all the functions of programs of Kelsa. On behalf of ILI and Kelsa and all of you, I express deep gratitude to Advocate Thomas. Thank you, sir. Advocate Sud Parthasaradi, Advocate Madras High Court, has accepted our humble invitation and made a wonderful lecture on doctrine of proportionality. Lessons from comparative constitutional law. On behalf of ILI, Kelsa, and Kerala High Court Advocate Association, I express deep gratitude. Thank you, sir. Sri PG Jayashankar Advocate is also a member of the Executive Council of ILI Kerala. I am delivered the welcome address. On behalf of all of all of us, I will I extend express a deep gratitude to Mr. Jayashankar. Honorable judges of the High Court attended this program online by accepting our humble invitation. On behalf of ILI, Kelsa, and High Court Advocate Association, I express our deep gratitude to all the judges of the High Court. The learned judicial officers of the subordinate judiciary, advocates, panel lawyers, paralegal volunteers, staff of Kelsa, District Legal Service Authority, Permanent Logatalat, KSMCC, the Defense Council System, all the people have attended this program online. I express a deep gratitude to each one of you. I may be failing my duty if I omit to mention two names. It is none other than Honorable Mr. Justice Alexander Thomas, Judge High Court of Kerala and Chairman ILI Kerala, and I think Jacob P. Alex. Those two persons are instrumental for arranging this program in a wonderful manner. This lordship was, though absent in the function, is giving timely direction and giving instructions. On behalf of all of us, 
I express deep gratitude to Honorable Justice Alexander Thomas sir, and also Advocate Jacob P. Alex. Once again, thank you all. Jai Hind. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, now, with the leave of the chair, let us conclude the session with the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jaya hai Bharata bhagya vidhata Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha Dravida utkada vanga हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे